In this roundup of the week, the second wave of infections is notable by its absence. The WHO comes under attack, furious debates break out over how quickly to get back to normal, and we see disturbing signs of the silencing of voices critical of the virus lockdown. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome back to the species-wide bout of procrastination that is 2020. I hope you're well and dodging the virus. If you value the independent, critically minded and non-ideological voice for this channel provides, please consider becoming a patron. Having launched the Patreon page properly for the first time last week, I'm delighted that the first few of you have responded, some quite generously. Thank you to all of those people. When talking about controversial topics can get videos demonetized or worse by YouTube, and more about that later, it provides a security and an encouragement because those controversial topics are very often the ones we most want to talk about. Go to patreon.com forward slash Malenbaker to support and thanks in advance. And last week I reported that certain nervous voices were being raised in Germany. Alarmed by what they thought were the first signs of a second wave of COVID-19 that was going to come sweeping in as the country relaxed some of its lockdown measures. Indeed, I asked the question, why wouldn't it? The virus shows no signs of being seasonal, so isn't it inevitable that as soon as relaxation takes place, it will come sweeping back in? Well, one week later, and the overwhelming indicator so far is, well, actually, no. Those very early signs in Germany were just people jumping at shadows, or more accurately, standard variability. So far, the countries that have been lifting lockdown, Germany, Denmark, Italy, Spain, none of them have seen any resurgence in new cases. Now, it wasn't just me who'd assumed such a resurgence must surely follow. The Denmark State Serum Institute, SSI, while announcing a record low of 46 new cases, which was the lowest daily increase since mid-March, said this. We don't understand why there aren't more cases. There should have been more, they realised. Denmark has stepped up its testing capacity and reopened significant parts of the country from lockdown four to five weeks ago, but no spike in new cases. They said, we do not know whether this is due to high compliance with physical distance and hygiene advice, or whether it's possibly due to biological conditions, such as weakening of virulence or infectiousness by the virus. Now, there's time lags between people getting infected and showing up in statistics, so it's still kind of early days. It could all change. Even so, you would have expected to see more than we've seen. And you have to hope for the weary and embattled people, particularly in the worst hit countries, that there's now some respite ahead. Dr. Carol Sikora, a British oncologist and former director of the World Health Organization, suggested that there's a real chance the coronavirus could burn out before a vaccine is even developed. A video of him saying that was removed by YouTube for a while until an outcry persuaded them to reinstate it. I've linked to it in the video description. Have a watch! and be amazed at the moderate, sensible discussion considered by YouTube to be too dangerous to be seen. Picking up on some of the themes I covered last week, Sikora thought that the world is more immune than projections have so far suggested. But that's just one opinion. We have to be aware of giving more weight to the opinions we'd like to believe, and others are significantly less optimistic, highlighting that since less than 10% of the world has, they think, been exposed to the virus, then, as the song goes, there may be trouble ahead. Some have suggested that although we may see cases die down now, we'll be in for an even bigger hit in the late autumn and winter. And that may well be true. It may be seasonal after all. It's still not clear why cases through the summer should be diminished. In Sweden, which has avoided a tight lockdown, although its citizens have been adapting their behaviour to some degree, the number of new cases and deaths are drifting down only very slowly, much less than those countries that have successfully locked down. Indeed, the absence of a surge of cases in other countries has suddenly exposed Sweden much more starkly as the outlier. This week it saw a higher death per capita than any other European country, although its totals are still behind the worst overall. The fact that the number of cases and deaths remains relatively high doesn't suggest there's any kind of inbuilt self-destruct mode in the virus that's kicking in. 
Likewise in the UK, which did try to lock down, but the figures are clearly showing well, we managed to get something badly wrong. Cases and deaths remain stubbornly high. They are gently drifting downwards, thank goodness. And the same for the United States. These are neither the figures you'd expect to see if this was a seasonal virus, nor the figures you would see if the early pessimism of some of the scientists were correct. The countries that seem to be in the biggest trouble right now would include Brazil, where the official position of President Bolsonaro has been crisis. What crisis? Although the states have not been so sanguine and have implemented some restrictive measures. Brazil overtook the UK this week to have the third highest number of infections in the world, although its per capita number of deaths, which is a more meaningful measure in many ways, is still on the low side at 95 deaths per million, compared to Belgium at 793. The problem with a couple of the South American countries is that the averages can hide the fact that there's a bigger outbreak concentrated in a couple of relatively huge megacities, where the health services can end up completely overwhelmed, even as the national averages don't look that exceptional. Which, of course, is also really what happened in the US. The US deaths per million is in the mid-range of awful, at 291. But if you isolate New York and treat it as a country in its own right, then New York takes the lead massively at 1,485 deaths per million, two times higher than any country in the world. But going back to Sweden, that lack of a second wave elsewhere has immediately raised the question again as to whether the country made a ghastly mistake in not following everyone else into lockdown. Their best argument has always been everyone else would eventually get the same rates of infection as them. Lockdown only delays this and the economic pain becomes much worse in the process. Obviously now if all the other countries fail to get that devastating second wave, the only thing that's left is the significantly higher death toll in Sweden to many other comparable countries. This is kind of why it's good not to jump in too early to come to definite conclusions and especially not to invest emotionally in a particular position. If you decided early on that the Swedish example was definitely the right thing because it didn't impose a lockdown, as some people did, you could easily catch yourself wishing for a new wave of cases to hit all the other countries to justify your position and hoping that their economies suffer worse than Sweden's and so on. I mean, hopefully as soon as you step back, you'll quickly remember that you don't really want those things at all. I hope... And I would add that as the final picture does become clear at the end of 2020, when we see if the autumn brought a new wave or not, we should look back and resist the temptation to blame on the basis of what we know then, rather than what we knew at the start. Both Sweden and the others made rational, defensible decisions based on what everyone knew. There'll be plenty to criticise, no doubt, not least how appallingly bad most countries have been in protecting the elderly in their care homes. Now, fortunately, all the countries of the world have been united in agreeing to put off all arguments about blame and responsibility until the crisis has been fully dealt with. I'm kidding. Of course not. They're fighting like cats in a bag, obviously. The World Health Organization assembly took place this week and that was always going to be an early opportunity for the geopolitical opponents to take pot shots at each other and particularly for the Trump administration to attack the WHO itself for its alleged oversupport of China and for China to seek to fill the space left by America's apparent retreat from global leadership. President Trump refused to give an address to the Assembly while slamming the WHO for failing its core mission and suggesting that it had to sort some things out within 30 days or else the US would end its funding for the body permanently. It also criticised China directly, albeit not by name, saying that one member country had ignored its transparency obligations. In response, China did exactly what I suggested they would do a couple of weeks ago. They promised that any vaccine produced in their country would quickly be made globally accessible as a global public good. Because this is the fault line that the rest of the world is noticing. And they're noticing it because they kind of have a direct interest. The Americans have made no promises about the sharing of vaccines. Indeed, they were one of several countries who objected to the framing of coronavirus immunisation as a global public good in a section of the conference resolution. 
and the world has already seen the Trump administration approaching a German medical company and seeking to buy exclusive access of a vaccine for the US, something which raised alarm bells across the world. Trump has set a target to manufacture 300,000 doses of the vaccine by January, which would be enough to vaccinate the entire American population. We'll ignore for now that apparently one in five Americans has said that they wouldn't take such a vaccine. Such has been the power of the anti-vaxxer voices in the last few months. In contrast to the America First approach, China has been being as helpful and generous as possible, promising to share the vaccine, providing PPE support to Italy, which, according to a poll in April, has led to a higher percentage of Italians saying the country should develop relations more with China than said the same for America. Political leaders, on the other hand, are not so taken with China's operation and to China's displeasure have been calling for an independent investigation into the causes of a pandemic to focus on what actually happened and what was covered up. Most of them are furious at the massive damage done to their countries and they see Beijing seeking to use the situation to their advantage and they've suddenly realised how exposed they might be. For example, the UK just realised how high a percentage of all pharmaceuticals in its country are manufactured in China and have now formed a committee to look at diversifying supply chains to reduce their exposure. The investigation agreed at the WHO doesn't refer specifically to China. The WHO Director General has been tasked to make it happen. We can expect to see major battles over how soon that takes place, what its terms of reference are going to be, and who gets to take part. I'd even go so far as to predict it could end up being the fault line that blows up the WHO. In the meantime, bitter rows and arguments have also broken out around the world about how quickly lockdown was imposed and, more importantly, how far and how fast countries should relax lockdown. The least helpful is focused on the former. In the US, Jeffrey Shaman of Columbia University said that 83% of coronavirus deaths could have been avoided in the US if it had locked down on March the 1st. Likewise, in the UK, Kit Yates, co-director of Bath University's Centre for Mathematical Biology, which is a thing, apparently, suggested that entering lockdown one week earlier could have a dramatic impact on the number of deaths. For this, he drew on a piece of work done by James Annan, a climate change modeller. Both Shaman and Yates stroke Annan get my prize for the most universally useless contributions to a crisis in modern times. For a start, they're offering the results of computer models, and they should notice that such models have not covered themselves in glory in this particular pandemic. The only difference is that if you retrofit your predictions to a past that never happened, then your predictions are completely unfalsifiable. Second, even if the results are 100% accurate, how is that even remotely a helpful message? Here's a thing I've said before on this channel. Whenever somebody does something right, you can always criticise by saying it should have been done quicker. I mean, always. You can say that. I can't find a record of any of these gentlemen calling for a lockdown on the dates they're now parading. None whatsoever. On March 1st, the US had seen a total of 89 cases and two deaths. Would the US have happily gone into a full lockdown at that point? I mean, maybe. Would the Democrats have nodded sagely at President Trump's wisdom had he decided to go down the route? Eh, Probably not. What we don't have yet is any sense of the full consequences of lockdown. In the UK, the non-coronavirus health service has all but shut down during lockdown. The deaths from cancer and heart disease and other illnesses that will follow in the coming six months or so are not factored into anybody's computer models. Political leaders faced with a disease nobody understood with the certainty that whatever decisions they took, their opponents were going to be denouncing them for directly killing people. Those are the people we've asked to take a lead through this crisis. It's a pretty unwinnable, thankless task to have. I remain of a view that, particularly for the actions taken early on, they should be given a fair degree of latitude. And that means not turning on the full force of 2020 hindsight, supported by unprovable computer modelling, to parade the vision of preventable deaths. So that's been one thing. More important have been the rows over how quickly we come out of lockdown. 
because at least this is something we can do something about that will actually make a difference. The UK announced that children could return to school from June the 1st, only to have the largest teaching union attack the plans as reckless. Mary Bowstead, Joint Secretary General of the NEU, said this. Coronavirus continues to ravage communities in the UK and the rate of COVID-19 infection is still far too great for the wider opening of our schools. 13 councils across the country have said that they won't open schools to the Prime Minister's set date and said that teachers, unions and councils all needed to be persuaded that it was safe. Well, that's tricky because, you know, letting kids walk to school every day is not sort of safe, safe. But that's a discussion for a society in a slightly less frazzled state of mind. Around 1,500 primary schools were expected to ignore the date. The government's countered by pointing out the damage that's being done to children by keeping them out of school. And to some extent, this reflects the national state of anxiety. Polls earlier in the month showed that fewer than one in five British people thought it was time to reopen schools and other places. On the school side, it's not as though we have to theorise about the risk of opening schools. We now have a growing body of practical evidence from around the world. If we're worried about children catching the disease and dying, there's very little data to justify that fear. By and large, children do not get the disease. They may catch the virus, but almost none develop symptoms, and those that do are overwhelmingly mild cases. In China, children comprise just 2.4% of reported cases of COVID-19. Of those, only 2.5% experienced significant symptoms and just 0.2% became seriously ill. In other words, 0.0048% of reported cases were seriously ill children. Worldwide, there have been no deaths reported so far in young children and barely a handful of children under the age of 19. Sweden has had the lowest percentage of cases in children and it never closed its schools. Dr Frank Esper, a paediatric infectious diseases specialist at Cleveland Children's Clinic, said this. Normal coronaviruses seem to affect children and adults equally, but this one, for whatever reason, certainly skews more to the adult population. But the more significant point is surely this. We're behind a number of other countries that have reopened their schools already. 22 EU states have reopened their schools. Wherever they've done so, there have been no problems, no new spikes of infection, no big problems at the schools themselves. Why wouldn't we assume that if it's working for them, it should work for us? Part of the explanation's political. The councils that are crying foul are mostly Labour councils. But part of it is fear. A lot of people are really anxious and not all of that fear is well informed by the facts of a pandemic. One journalist talked about how she tried to encourage people to support a petition to get children back to school and was hit by a wave of hostility. Some of the responses included these. Education matters, but so does not dying. Boo hoo! My kids miss their friends. They'll miss them a lot more if they're dead. And so on. And she got almost no support whatsoever. Alistair Hames has a great article on The Critic website where he points out that people got that scared because the government and its advisers deliberately encouraged it. The minutes of meetings of the government's sage body showed that the public was explicitly scared to get them to comply with lockdown. And OK, yes, you can manipulate people like that up to a point, but once you've created the fear, you can't just switch it off again. Just today, Sage released a new report on returns to school which offered the following advice. Delaying a school reopening by two weeks to the 15th of June approximately halves the risk to children. In the report, they acknowledge all the evidence suggesting very low risk. But then with that as the headline, you can imagine the impact. Because who wouldn't want to halve the risk to children? I mean, OK, they're not quantifying the risk, but it must be bad if it's worth mentioning, right? It sort of raises the question about the ethics of manipulating people so powerfully in the cause of achieving public policy objectives. I'm not saying that at a time of pandemic there's no case for the defence, just that it shouldn't be something that passes by by default. And as I said, I don't blame them for doing it in the first place. After all, they'd had Neil Ferguson's report suggesting that half a million people might die if they didn't get people to stay inside. I don't blame them for doing it then. But Prime Minister Johnson still quotes that half a million figure when he's making a presentation now, which doesn't really make sense 
when there's only been 330,000 deaths across the entire world to date, with a well-advanced declining curve in most countries. Of course, 330,000 deaths is terrible. Every one of those is a personal tragedy. But thank goodness it's not the many millions that we would have seen if that model had actually been correct. The level of fear people now have plays out in other ways, of course. Today, we saw plenty of stories of the all the onlookers who were horrified at the numbers of young people flocking to the beaches during the hot weather who were apparently not wholly focused on keeping two metres apart, but rather getting a suntan and having fun. By and large, though, we've seen increasing amounts of evidence. The likelihood of transmission in the open air is generally incredibly low, and the hot sunshine means that virus residues on surfaces are killed relatively quickly. So while it would be better, for sure, if everyone was 100% scrupulous in following the rules, the quantity of outrage is probably disproportionate to the degree of additional risk. Because we've seen such things happening as well in other countries, and it didn't race out of control. One example of that has surely been the state of Florida. Florida didn't shut down its beaches when others did. People predicted that Florida was going to be hit by disaster, that it would be the next New York and Governor Ron DeSantis would be to blame. Ron DeSantis was the villain governor compared to Andrew Cuomo, whose state of New York was the epicentre of the pandemic. There's a great article titled Where Does Ron DeSantis Go To To Get His Apology, which I'll link to in the video description. And it quotes DeSantis saying this, The day that the media had their first big freak out about Florida was March 15th, where there were people on Clearwater Beach and it was this big deal. That same day is when we signed the executive order to one, ban visitation in the nursing homes and two, ban the reintroduction of a COVID positive patient back into a nursing home. And the article goes on. DeSantis is bemused by the obsession with Florida's beaches. When they opened in Jacksonville, it was a big national story, usually relayed with a dire tone. Jacksonville has almost no COVID activity outside of a nursing home context, he says. Their hospitalizations are down, ICU down since the beaches opened a month ago, and yet nobody talks about it. DeSantis said they looked at the South Korea experience and Italy, and saw that the disease targeted the elderly and certain at-risk groups. They looked at history, the 1918, 1957, 1968 pandemics, where there'd been no overall shutdown. They decided to first protect the nursing homes, of which Florida has 4,000, looking after 350,000 residents. They worked hard to try to keep the virus out of those, particularly ensuring that possibly infected people didn't get sent from a hospital into nursing homes. And that, of course, is exactly the opposite of what happened in New York, as well as the UK and Sweden, and even some of the countries being heralded for their successful approach overall. This graph, showing the number of deaths in care homes, shows that is actually one area where the UK did better than many of the others, including Germany. What comes out of all of this? Perhaps one message above all? We can be sure of very little when we look at the last couple of months. But one thing we can say is that there's no evidence that there's been one unquestionably self-evident truth justifying one unquestionably self-evident global policy. In that environment, it's not been helpful for YouTube and others to close down well-informed critical voices about the correctness of policies that are being pursued. I mentioned Dr. Carol Sikora's video earlier. You can add to that the video of Dr. Nut Witkowski the former head of biostatistics, epidemiology and research design at Rockefeller University. His video, arguing for herd immunity policies, were also removed from YouTube. As far as I'm aware, that one is yet to be reinstated. I may be wrong about that. According to YouTube, it removes videos that it believes argues for and encourages people to ignore locally stated requirements or guidelines. It doesn't seem obvious why his video would have fallen foul of that. This is precisely the time when we need to have clear information and rational argument. Of course, people should follow the policies of their government, whether they think they're well judged or not. As I said last week, a well-executed imperfect policy is better than one that's undermined by non-compliance. But that isn't the same as shutting down debate and argument. The reason why authoritarian governments so often go wrong is that their bad decisions never get challenged. 
Why would we seek to mimic that weakness by shutting down well-informed and intelligent criticism? Well, that's all for this week. The final part of the How to Think About Climate Change series will go up next week. It'll be released a couple of days early, specifically for Patreon supporters. Just one small way to say thank you to those people for helping to make this possible. Have a good week. Stay safe. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Mm-hmm.